Hello everybody, I am Michelle Mays. I'm the clinical director at the Center for Relational Recovery outside of DC in Northern Virginia and the founder of Partner Hope. And I'm back with you to bring you another video talking about all things related to betrayal trauma and healing from betrayal trauma. So today I wanna to talk to you all about some patterns, really common patterns that I see betrayed partners often get stuck in. And these patterns have to do with fear. They often have fear at the core of them. So we're gonna talk about these patterns and then talk a little bit about the fear and how you deal with the fear as well. So you can see me duck down a little bit because I have my handy dandy notes here. And so I wanna kind of walk you through my thinking on this and uh, see if it resonates for you. All right, so if you are a betrayed partner, one common, there are some common patterns or places that I see betrayed partners frequently get stuck in. These are places that they can get stuck in and then they can stay stuck in them for quite some time. So one common place is, I know that I need to leave my relationship, but I'm too scared to. So not everybody needs to leave. So I'm only talking to those of you who know that you need to leave. You've gotten to the point where you're clear that your partner isn't going to change, your partner isn't going to repair the relationship, maybe your partner isn't going to stop the affair or stop the acting out behavior, uh, maybe the partner uh, just refuses to deal with what happened and wants you to sweep it under the rug and you can't re rebuild trust that way. Whatever the situation, you have come to the clarity that it's not changing and you've got a really long pattern, you've given it time, you've got a long pattern, you see that it's not changing, and you know that for you, the best thing to do would be to go ahead and exit the relationship, and yet you can't do it. You're too afraid, there's so much fear and panic and anxiety when you think about doing it that you can't do it. So that's one place of that partners get stuck, one pattern and way that partners can get stuck. Another way is I know that I need to set a boundary, but I'm unable to set the boundary. So this can look very similar. This can look like uh, my partner won't stop the affair. My partner won't stop acting out. My partner refuses to go uh, enter recovery and start therapy in a recovery program. My partner refuses to talk about what happened. My partner refuses to do a full disclosure. Whatever it is, it can be all kinds of different things. You know I need to set a boundary around what I need in order to stay in this relationship. There are certain things that I need if I'm going to stay in this relationship after this cheating has occurred and move forward with this person and they're being on non-responsive and so I, need, I know I need to set some bottom lines and boundaries and yet I can't do it. I keep talking and telling my partner what I need from them. They keep ignoring it, but I don't ever set a real boundary. And so that's another place where partners can get stuck. And both of these places are about fear. And again, they can look so many different ways for different people. But both of these, these sticking points are about fear of relational loss. So the fear is about the fear of actually leaving the relationship and what that will feel like and whether you will be able to tolerate what it feels like. There's panic and desperation and all kinds of anxiety for a lot of people around that thought. Or there's fear about relational loss in the sense that what if I set a boundary? What if I say something like, I really need you to go to therapy and enter a recovery program and stop the behaviors or else I'm going to need to separate because I can't stay in the relationship as long as you keep cheating on me, or as long as there's no recovery in place. So if you were to set that kind of boundary, again, your partner could say no. So your partner could refuse to do it. He could say, well, I'm not willing to do that. I'm going to continue in the affair. Or I'm gonna continue acting out. Or I've stopped, I promise I've stopped, but I don't need to do anything else. I'm not going to therapy, I'm not getting a recovery program, I'm not doing any of that. So you risk a no from your partner when you set a boundary. And for a lot of partners, that fear of the no 
that fear of the no and then the feeling of loss and disconnection from relationship with their partner is what silences them. It's what keeps them from using their voice and keeps them from setting boundaries. And then what happens is there's an enormous feeling of being stuck. And for most partners, there's this enormous feeling of feeling helpless and powerless and sort of at the mercy of the cheater. So sort of at the mercy of the cheating partner because no matter how much you ask them or tell them how hurt you are or tell them what you need, they're not responding. And so your fear then is, well, if I set a boundary, they're just not going to respond either. And you don't want to risk more loss. So you just stay stuck in this terrible, painful, painful place in the relationship. Or you stay in the relationship knowing you need to leave and you stay in and it's very painful to stay in because of the way you're being treated in the relationship. So these are, play, these are the kinds of stuck points that partners get into that are really driven by fear. And again, fear of relational loss. You always hear me come back to the relationship, come back to our attachment system, come back to the core of what I believe is driving most of our behavior in relationships, which is our need for relational connection and the way our attachment system functions in relationships. So one of the things I want to say to you is that if you're resonating with what I'm saying and you feel this fear and you've experienced this, you're very normal. It is very normal to have an enormous amount of fear around losing connection with those that we are uh, significantly bonded to. It's normal to have fear about leaving a relationship. It's normal to have fear about setting a boundary and risking more loss. That is really normal. So if you're experiencing that, I don't want you to pathologize the fear because the fear is normal. The fear is going to be there because our attachment systems are survival level systems within us. So we experience the threat of disconnection as a survival level threat. It feels like it threatens our very survival. This is why this is such a common place for partners to get stuck is because of the way that we're wired in terms of our attachments. So I really want you to know that and know that you're normal if you're experiencing that. So one of the things also that I think it's important to know about that kind of fear that comes up around our breaking of attachments, around losing uh, relational connection, for some people, not all, but for some betrayed partners, that fear is exacerbated because they experienced significant loss in their childhoods. Now, when I'm talking about significant loss in your childhood, that could be somebody that died or somebody that left. That does happen. But it can also just be being parented by somebody who is not consistently there for you or who is intermittently there for you. Or they're there for you, like they clothe you, they feed you, they show up to your soccer game, but they are not emotionally available to you. So if you had a childhood where you experienced that kind of relational disconnection from your parent, or from your caregiver, children are dependent, right? We are 100% dependent on our parents. We are helpless beings in the world when we come into the world and we're very vulnerable. So children do not have the resources to deal with relational loss and relational disconnection that adults do. So when a child experiences that kind of relational loss and that kind of relational uh, disconnect, particularly if it's chronic, if you've got neglect that is chronic over time, and neglect can be hard to pinpoint because it's about what you didn't get, not what you did get. So if you've experienced that, often for children, that is experienced as a very overwhelming sense of loneliness and abandonment along with fear and desperation. So it can feel very helpless, very desperate, very, very lonely, and very isolating. So if you had this experience in childhood in some way, and now here you are in adulthood and in your primary attachment, remember our romantic attachments mirror our attachments with our parents as children. In your primary attachment, you're now faced with loss, the potential loss of the relationship or loss by setting a boundary and experiencing some kind of like your partner getting angry and withdrawing for several days, 
your partner saying no, whatever it could be. If in your adult life, you're now facing that, it is gonna ring the bell on your childhood trauma. It's gonna bring that childhood desperation and loneliness and overwhelm alive inside of you. And one thing to understand is that the, the part of the brain that holds those childhood memories does not do a good job of differentiating past from present. So when the bell is rung in the present and it kind of reverberates back to the past and it brings that ch those childhood feelings alive, what it feels like in the body is that that desperation and overwhelming loneliness is being felt in the present. It feels like it's about your present situation and you don't often realize that it's actually about your past situation. So what happens for betrayed partners who have had this experience is that the fear that they feel with their cheating partner as they're facing exiting the relationship or they're looking at setting boundaries that could bring about some kind of disconnection is they will experience that sense of overwhelming fear, fear of loneliness, fear of isolation. And what they're afraid of is they're afraid they're going to feel like they did as a, as a child, that this is what's waiting for them that on the other side of leaving the relationship or on the other side of setting the boundary, what's waiting for them is this overwhelming loneliness, desperation, and panic. And that sense that that's what's on the other side of that decision is the thing that keeps betrayed partners stuck because they're like, I, I can't tolerate it. It feels like that will not be tolerable. I cannot do it. And so often they will remain stuck instead and not setting the boundary or not making the decision to leave the relationship. So often what is helpful around this is to do a lot of work with that child part of you that holds those original feelings and to help that child, help yourself, kind of plant yourself in your present adult self instead of being shot back to your child feeling reality. That's what Pia Melody calls it. She calls it your child feeling reality. And Pete also has a really great saying that adults cannot be abandoned, only children can be abandoned. Because when you're an adult, you always have yourself and you always have your adult resources and you have people around you, you have things to draw on that children do not have. Children are truly dependent. So only children can really be abandoned, but it feels like we can be abandoned when we experience the same fearful feelings and it shoots us back into how it felt when we experienced it as a child. So doing work on that to really plant yourself in your present adult self, your resourceful adult self, is often really helpful for betrayed partners who are dealing with this kind of fear and have that kind of childhood experience that's contributing to keeping them stuck and stuck where they're at. So one of the things, um, that I want to talk to you about is when you're stuck, when you're in this kind of stuck place where the fear is blocking you from taking the action that you know you need to take for your on your own behalf. Like you know there's action that you need to take to help yourself heal or to help yourself quit being wounded, quit being hurt or harmed by another person. So you know there's an action that you need to take on your own behalf, but you're too afraid to take it. And so you're staying in this sort of paralyzed, stuck place. There are a whole bunch of behaviors that I see partners do when they're in this place. And so I want to walk you through what are the what are the behavior patterns that I see partners do. It's not going to be comprehensive. There's going to be more than what I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you a few of them. And just let you kind of see, oh yeah, I may be doing that. And the purpose of these behaviors that we're going to look at is to distract you from the fear. It's to distract you from the fear of if I go through this decision, if I do this decision, I'm gonna feel panic, overwhelm, desperation, anxiety. It's to distract you from all of that. All those feelings that you think are waiting for you on the other side and the fear of those feelings. So partners, we're very creative. All of us are, humans are so creative and their ability to manage their emotional inner, inner worlds. So the things that partners do, there's some patterns that people fall into. 
and that they do to manage this fear, to manage what they think is waiting on the other side for them. And these are creative behaviors because we distract ourselves and we don't even know we're distracting ourselves. We don't realize that what we're actually doing is avoiding this whole emotional thing over here that we're so worried about and fearful of. So here are some of those behaviors. Here are some of the things that partners do. One is that they will obsess about the cheating partner's behaviors. So they will spend enormous amount of time Sherlocking, as I call it, like trying to find out what's going on, what's the cheating partner been getting up to. They will spend an inordinate amount of time talking to the cheating partner about their behaviors, thinking about what needs to happen, what the cheating partner should be doing, what the cheating partner should not be doing, uh, strategizing how to talk to the cheating partner to try to get them to do what they want them to do. There will just be enormous energy and bandwidth, like mental bandwidth and emotional bandwidth spent on really focusing on the cheating partner and all trying to get the cheating partner to do what you want them to do in terms of not continuing to cause you pain, right? You don't want them to continue being so painful so that you can be in a relationship with them. So a lot of energy goes into trying to figure out how to get the cheating partner to quit being so painful so that you could continue to be in a relationship with them. Again, all about ultimately distracting you from the fear and the feelings that are that you are afraid of feeling if you were to set a boundary instead or make a decision to in some way rescue yourself out of the path of harm that you're in with the cheating partner. Okay, second pattern that I see is what I, I like to call this trying to solve the Rubik's Cube. So what this is, is this, this pattern that betrayed partners get into where they just keep thinking and thinking and thinking about what is the right book or the right podcast or the right words, the magic words that will get the cheating partner to see the light. It will get them to understand what they need to do, get them to understand how much they've hurt you, get them to understand uh, what has gone on, and then they will change their pattern, they will change their path, and move into recovery, and start building trust with you, and start to be transparent, and start to be honest, and repair the relationship. So again, this is another form of that kind of obsessing, but it's this belief that the magic words have not been found yet. That there is this magic thing. If you can just solve the Rubik's Cube, you're going to get it. You're going to get those magic words, that magic thing that when you say it to your partner, they're going to have the aha moment and they're going to change course. So there can be a lot of trying, lots of different things, lots of different ways of articulating things, saying things, you know, looking for this magic key to unlock this bind that you're in with the partner, with your cheating partner. Okay, so third pattern, third distracting, remember these are distracting patterns. Third thing is try harder, try more. Okay, so what this means is this idea that maybe we just haven't tried hard enough. So maybe we need a different therapist. Maybe we need a different program. Maybe we need a different book. Maybe I just need to give him or her more time. Maybe I just need to change how I'm behaving. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to be more compliant. I'm going to try to be more pleasant. I'm going to try to be less confrontive. I'm going to try, try whatever. So this is like, I'm going to try more and try harder to again, get the cheating partner to do what I want them to do, which is quit causing me pain. And I'm going to invest a lot of energy in this again all a way of distracting yourself from what you really need to be doing, which is coming to your own rescue within the relationship and taking action on your own behalf. So uh, fourth pattern here is focusing on what you don't know in the relationship to avoid what you do know. So another thing I see partners do is they go down this path where they spend a lot of time trying to figure out what do I not know or thinking about a certain detail and trying to figure out the meaning of this detail, the meaning of this thing. And 
they're perseverating on that and ruminating on it. And in the meantime, they've got a lot of information that they know, a lot, a lot usually, and they're not letting themselves come into emotional contact with that information. They, by staying focused on what they don't know, they stay out of emotional contact with what they do know. And the reason for that is if they come into emotional contact with what they do know, boom, now they're over here in the fear of needing to set a boundary or maybe needing to leave the relationship. It brings them right to their main dilemma, which is their fear of the loss. So easier to stay in focusing on what you don't know instead of coming into that really painful dilemma. All right, and then the fifth pattern that I see partners get into as a form of distraction is uh, returning to confusion in the swirling mind. And so what this means is they sort of get hooked back in by the cheater often. They get hooked back into the gaslighting or they get hooked in by their own desire for it to be different. So what I mean by that is they want the relationship. They don't want to have to go through this loss. And of course they don't, like who wants to do that? Um, so they don't want to go through this loss. And so they get hooked on imagining that really the relationship is different than it really is and sort of operating in the relationship as though it is different than it really is. And what that leads to is a lot of confusion, a lot of fogginess and swirling in the mind about what's really true and what's really not true and what's going on here and what's not going on here. So that these are all patterns that are very preoccupying. They really take the betrayed partner's focus and attention and energy and shift it into a direction that is a, moves them away from having to confront the fear of loss and the fear of relational loss with the cheating partner. So these are all, again, they're distracting you from a very painful reality and a painful reality that feels too painful to deal with. The issue with these patterns is that over and over again, they place you in a powerless position with the cheating partner. So over and over and over again, in, when you're in these patterns that I just talked about, you are giving your power to the cheating partner. And because you are waiting for the cheating partner to see the light, you know, get the magic words, make a change of some sort, the right person, the right therapist, the right thing is going to somehow make them turn and go in a different direction. And the reality is that for most cheating partners, the thing that makes them turn is when you set serious boundaries. Most cheating partners, because of the thinking distortions and delusions that they are trapped in along with the cheating behaviors, they're not thinking very clearly. And they are trying to hold on to both you and the uh, affair partner or the addiction often. So the thing that is effective often in relationships is when you get clear and you set real crisp boundaries. But again, it is a big risk when you do that. So all these patterns are there to distract you from this reality. And again, it makes you feel helpless. It makes you feel uh, very stuck. You're often in this place where you're circling, doing what I call circling the drain because you've given your power to the cheating partner and you're just waiting for them to change so that then you can feel better, so that then you can be in a different place. So there's a quote by Scott Peck that says, uh, mental health is a commitment to reality at all costs. And when you're in these patterns, these distracting patterns, what you're often doing is you're not in reality because you're not paying attention to, this is what's happening, this is what my partner is doing, and this is what I need to do in order to help myself, in order to move forward and heal. So you're often sacrificing you being in clarity and clarity about your reality, which means then that you're sacrificing your own mental health in the process. So staying in these patterns and avoiding the fear and avoiding uh, what's on the other side of taking these actions does cost you a lot. It, it keeps you in pain, it keeps you in helplessness, it keeps you outside of clarity, 
and really being grounded in reality. And then it affects your own mental and emotional health in really negative and damaging ways. So how do you get out of this pattern? So what do we do about this enormous feeling of fear and this fear of what's on the other side? Like what, what do you as a betrayed partner need to do to help yourself with this? So one of the things I talked about earlier is it's really important to get planted in your present adult self. And if you do have childhood trauma that's exacerbating this fear and exacerbating being stuck, it's really important to get help with that so that you can be in your present and not have your past determining your present. Because if that little desperate, helpless, abandoned child is making decisions about your marriage and about what's going to happen in your relationship, then you're going to have a lot of difficulty uh, making good decisions for yourself and taking good care of yourself and doing what's really best for you. So getting help with that can be really, really helpful. Another thing that you can do is to really work on staying in reality. So really work on bringing yourself into the present and into awareness about what is really true. What is really true here in my situation and then getting support and help to tolerate the feelings that come up when you come into emotional contact with what's true. Because in the situations I'm talking about, and I know not everybody is in the situation that I'm addressing today, but in the situation that I'm talking about, this is a situation where the cheating partner is not being very, um, they're not making a lot of effort to repair or get into recovery or do whatever is needed. And so you as a betrayed partner are in this very painful place in your relationship. So getting support to help you process the feelings about that and process what you, that means to you is really, really important. So another thing is to shift your understanding of what it is, how you deal with fear and what it is that really shifts fear. So when I was going through my own process of healing from betrayal and dealing all of, with all of this, I believed what I see many, many, many betrayed partners fall into. So what I believed is that I needed to sort of wait for the fear to go away. And once the fear went away, then I could take action. And I kind of thought I just needed to work harder in therapy or I needed to do more work uh, around my childhood trauma or I needed to do more of something to help the fear go away. And once the fear diminished, then I would be able to take the action that I needed to take. That's a really, really common belief. And the reality is that what I see happen for a lot of betrayed partners and what certainly happened for me is that the fear actually got worse. The more I kind of knew about the fear and looked at it and knew what I needed to do, but wasn't able to do it and was really stuck and really paralyzed and all of that, the fear actually kind of grew and got worse. And I call that anticipatory fear, right? It's the anticipatory fear of knowing that you need to do something and it just feels like you're going to die if you do it. So the thing that actually does shift fear is taking the action, is doing the thing you need to do even though you are afraid. And when I did that for myself and my own story, when I did the things that I was afraid of doing, that I literally thought were going to kill me, that I was going to die from if I did them, when I did them almost instantaneously, like almost immediately, the fear went, whew, the fear came way, way down. Because I found on the other side that I was still whole and I was still there and I was still okay and I still had people around me who loved me and I still had support and I still had myself and I nothing that I thought was going to happen, happened. All the fear rooted in my own childhood stuff was not, uh, did not manifest in the way that I thought that it would. And I have walked so many partners through this fear point over the years. 
And for none of them, it does not manifest the way they are afraid that it is going to manifest. Uh, it does not overwhelm them. It does not take them out in the way that they think that it's going to. So the real answer for the fear is to walk into and do the thing that you're afraid of. And the fear then lessens tremendously and you find, oh, I am okay. Like I can do this. I am okay and I can do it. So waiting for the fear to go away and waiting for the fear to diminish before taking action is actually part of what keeps you stuck and drives you back into those distract patterns of distraction that we were talking about earlier. All right, so I, um, I hope that this is helpful in terms of helping you think about fear, the role of fear, how it shows up, how it pushes you over to these distracting patterns. Hopefully looking at those will help you move out of them and not stay there for a really long time. Um, if you want more help with this, we are working on this in Braving Hope in the 12-week coaching program that I offer. And you're, uh, the folks in there are learning a ton about betrayal trauma and really understanding what has happened. Uh, I think all of them have a new understanding, new language, a new way of really articulating the experience for themselves. But we are also working on this fear and working on what does it mean to take full responsibility for yourself and take action on your own behalf to help yourself and not give your power away to your partner, but keep your power with yourself. So we'll put the link below the video. And if you'd like to join us, please, uh, Sign up for an enrollment call and we'll be happy to chat with you and see if the program is a good fit for you. And if it isn't, we'll talk to you about what is and help you kind of figure out what the next steps are for yourself. All right, take care and I'll talk to you next time.